Unexpected God, your advent alarms us, wakes us from your drowsy worship, from the sleep that neglects love, and the sedative of misdirected frenzy. Awaken us now to your coming, and bend our angers into your peace. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah 11. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the third chapter of Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire." This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. One of my dearest friends got married a few years ago at Montreat. She asked if I would be her matron of honor and if Bethan would be her flower girl. I emphatically said yes to both, but kept my anxiety of Bethan performing to just Cal and I. Well, my buddy knew my daughter well, and rather than ask her to do the traditional role of distributing flowers down the aisle before her big entrance, she asked Bethan to play a tambourine. If you have not had the privilege of attending a wedding with a tambourine girl, let me paint the picture. 
The attendants are at the front of the church, and the little girl is decked out in her sparkly, adorable attire. She's positioned with her percussive device fixed with long, flowing ribbons. She's at the back of the church, ready for the cue. When all stand, all eyes go to the little girl who begins to saunter down the middle aisle, playing the tambourine like you have never heard before. Ribbons flying in the wake of cuteness. As you can imagine, our Bethan loved every minute of it. Our passage today is similar to a tambourine girl before the bride. John the Baptist paves the way for Jesus. He gets people's attention. He clangs his instrument. He was noticed. People came to see this wild man, the one that wore the same clothes as Elijah, the one that stood in the water baptizing people and calling them to repent of their ways. John the Baptist was unusual, countercultural. He ate honey and bugs. He was a stark difference from those in the city. He was of the wilderness. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have similar stories, but they're all told from different perspectives. Of those similar stories, only the Gospels of Matthew and Luke tell the story of Jesus' birth. Yet, all four Gospels mention John the Baptist. John had an important role. He set the stage for the Messiah. He was the forerunner, the precursor, the catalyst. He proclaimed loudly and for whoever would hear, repent for the kingdom of God has come. Prepare the way of the Lord. John did not hold back. He said it all. He called names. He spoke hard truths. He was a threat to the politicians. He proclaimed to their faces, You brood of vipers, the powerful one is coming. John baptized with water, but there will be one that will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. When we read this passage, we do not finish by saying, And Merry Christmas! No, no, this text is hard. We're left in a quandary. The resonating sounds of repentance and fire repeating over and over in our head. John was a catalyst for the coming of Jesus. He was the precipitating thing that readied Judea for the coming of Christ. Similarly, fire acts as a catalyst for us. It readies us for the second coming of Jesus by helping us to repent. Now, fire is a curious thing. When we sit by a fire, we easily become entranced by it. We watch as it dances and burns. It has a mesmerizing quality to it. It instigates us into thought. If it's uncontrolled, It spurs other things to happen, fear, terror. When we think of an unquenchable fire, what might you think of? Perhaps selfie videos of people racing away from wildfires, or stop, drop, and roll, or how to save your beloved from its powerful consumption. There are so many thoughts that fire brings forth. Ultimately, fire has a way of increasing our acuity, our keenness, our awareness. Last week, Patrick talked about staying awake. And staying awake in this Advent season with eyes open, spirit awake. He commented on the posture in which to receive the coming of Emmanuel, a posture of hands out, ready to receive, open to what is to come.
When we talk about fire, the posture quickly goes to fear. Our posture becomes one of anxiousness and defense. But what the unquenchable fire does is point us to self-reflection. I met this week with a small cohort of people for the Lunch and Learn Bible study. Shameless plug for Look at Your Bulletin Tuesday. And we talked about this passage. We talked about an assortment of things in this rich reading. And someone shared a story of what came to mind when she hears the word repentance. She shared an encounter of her and her dad when she was little. She came from a big family, and on one particular day, she was not doing quite what she was supposed to be doing. And she said something to her dad about her actions, but the memory that remained and planted to this day is that her dad took hold of her arm gently and firmly and said, show me. Whenever she thinks about repentance, she thinks of this, repentance as an action. The word repent in English means regret or remorse, but the Greek word originally used in this passage offers us so much more depth. It means taking on a new mindset, an about turn, a new world view, a complete change. As she shared her story, my own thinking was prompted. When Cal and I have taught our children about apologizing, it involves an action. When Jude, our 15-month-old, does something and needs to apologize, we've taught him to take his hand and to gently rub the person he has wronged. He's unable to use his words, And so we're teaching him that he must illustrate with his actions his feelings of remorse. John the Baptist proclaims this point to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Repentance is not about our ancestry. It's not about our salvation. It is the response we must make in regards to our salvation. How are we to prepare for the coming of Jesus? It is through our fruits. This action of bearing fruit, this is the action of response. This is our act of repentance. When we apologize for something, our behavior must change. If you hit me in the face and apologize, you can't keep hitting me in the face. Your actions must change in order for the apology to mean anything. Repentance, as a new beginning, offers us hope. It provides us with a means of new life in the midst of life's muddiness. One commentary says, Here at the muddy Jordan, in the wilderness of Judea, a real place with a name and a history and its own particular mess, there is still a place where the hopeful word of repentance is spoken and new beginnings are live options. The role of wilderness is an interesting one. For it's in the wilderness that people come face to face with God. Immediately following this passage, Jesus gets baptized and then goes off into the wilderness. The wilderness is a holy place. It's where we learn who God is and who we are in relation to God. As the Pharisees and Sadducees, the aristocratic and religious leaders, made their way into the wilderness to see this unique man, this wild John the Baptist, he called them out. Your lineage, your ancestry does not matter. It is the fruit you bear. And making this applicable for our context, it's not about our salvation. It is the effect our salvation has 
on our lives. In this Advent season, in this time of waiting in anticipation for the second coming of Christ, we can think of the fire, not as the fire of destruction, but as the refiner's fire. It's through this unquenchable fire that we are able to open ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit. Upon changing our posture, we can begin to do self-work to prepare our hearts so that we are ready to receive Christ's coming. When John the Baptist says that the kingdom of God is near, the word near can also be interpreted as at hand. The kingdom of God is happening now and is also coming. You might have heard it referred to as the now and the not yet. The unquenchable fire is a catalyst for repentance so that we might live in the now and not yet. The role of fire is mysterious. It's mentioned throughout the Bible and it plays many different roles, but its most prominent role is that of sanctifier and purifier. Psalm 66 says, Bless our God, O peoples, let the sound of God's praise be heard, who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us and have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a spacious place. Unquenchable fire helps distinguish between the chaff and the wheat. The Holy Spirit and fire work complementary rather than oppositional. It's through the work of the Holy Spirit and fire that self-work and refining happens. So how do we allow the Holy Spirit and fire to refine our lives? How do we prepare the path? How do we prepare our hearts for the second coming of Christ? How do we make our posture one of open arms and acceptance? When I think about the now and not yet, I think about the incredible ministries that this church is a part of. I think of the homeless women who stayed here this past week and how we were able to offer extra beds on multiple nights because it was cold outside. I think about those who volunteered to stay awake through the wee hours of the morning to make sure someone was available if something was needed. I think about those who brought warm food and served them, those who drove the van for them, the preschool children that collected things to give. As the children sorted through their Halloween candy so that their candy might make someone else's day. These examples of love are demonstrations of the kingdom of God at hand. They are examples of people who have begun to pave the way. When we allow ourselves to be in the posture of receiving, we are open to see these glimpses of the kingdom. We are able to clear aside the chaff and allow the wheat to be present. We are able to prepare the way for the coming of Emmanuel. As you wait in anticipation, I encourage you to ask yourself, what is your personal chaff that needs to be burned? What is cluttering the path that is keeping Jesus from being fully received? The promise of the Holy Spirit is that the chaff will be cleared away. The kingdom of God is at hand. Let us pray. Holy One, Help us to ready our beings for the work of the Holy Spirit. Give us endurance to do the hard work of preparation. Let your unquenchable fire refine our hearts 
so that we might be able to see your work and be ready for what is to come. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.